3rd Infantry Division cases colors before deployment. Soldiers support their community. A Thanksgiving feast at Hunter. Welcome to this week's Marne Report. I'm Caitlin Kenny, And I'm Sergeant First Class Jonathan Bell with Division Public Affairs. Our top story this week is about 200 soldiers from the 3rd Infantry Division. They're on their way to Afghanistan as the U.S. Forces National Support Element, part of the Resolute Support Mission. Division Commander Major General Mike Murray says case in the colors never gets easier. The ceremonies get easier because you practice them, but the, the fact of what that symbolizes doesn't get easier. I mean, there's still families that we're leaving. There's still soldiers that are going to go into harm's way. You know, it's combat operations are ending in Afghanistan, but it's still an area of active hostilities. Um, so there's still families, you know, Saturday night are going to be saying goodbye to soldiers getting on a plane. So the, the actual ceremony, sure, it gets easier. What it symbolizes never gets easier. The 3rd Infantry Division has cased its color six times since 9-11. Retired U.S. Navy mechanic Rick Buckley is a Vietnam veteran that turned his four years of service into a successful career as the owner and operator of a local motorcycle business. Photojournalist Zach Renstrom sat down with Buckley and tells us his story. Riding through this world all alone God takes your soul You're on your own I went in right after high school and uh, it was a chance to leave my hometown, a chance to get out of the state and see something new, something, you know, travel. It sounds fun to all of a sudden leave town and go someplace exotic, you know. It's still a little bit scary when you're an 18 year old. And so the fact that you could go with somebody that you knew takes a little bit of the fear out of it. The buddy plan only guarantees you to be together through boot camp. And, uh, and in fact, that's the way it was with me and my, my friend at the time. I went uh, down to Tennessee, of all places, to go to school there. They call it an A school. It's in Millington, Tennessee. And uh, I went there to become an aviation machinist mate, which is just another word for jet mechanic. I was in the aviation branch, if you will, of the, of the U.S. Navy. So from A school, I was sent to uh, Whidbey Island, Washington. And uh, I was in an A6 squadron, uh, VA-128, which is a more or less a training squadron for uh, people that are going on to do more work in, uh, on A6s. And uh, so I spent some time in that uh, in that squadron, and then I was transferred to my, per my my permanent squadron, if you will, which was VA-165. When it came time to do a cruise, uh, the whole the whole squadron would pack up everything we had and go to San Diego and get aboard the uh, aircraft carrier. I made two deployments on the uh, Constellation, the first one being a Vietnam air cruise. When you're standing on the pier looking at an aircraft carrier, it's just, it's immense. And uh, they're, even, they're even larger today than, than the, the aircraft carrier that I was on. My thing at that time was, I was, an old, I was a car guy. I enjoyed working on cars. And I thought I could go to the Navy and learn that as a trade so that when I got out, I would know how to you know, fix dents and paint, and because I figured they've got cars, you know, and so that was what I was shooting for when I when I went down to the recruiting office. After A school, I went, like I said, to Woodby Island, Washington, and eventually ended up in uh, VA 165. And uh, while there, uh, the first cruise that I was on that was Vietnam Air Cruise, I was a plane captain. I was the kind of the caretaker of one particular aircraft. Uh, I would be the one that made sure it was ready to fly every day, and and that it was. Uh, service properly and uh, help the when the pilots uh, and the bombardier navigator would get in the plane help them to get buckled in and, and get the plane off and so I did that for the for the whole nine month cruise that we were on uh, in 1973. To me it, it wasn't like really being in Vietnam I, I was uh, although I did sea land once that was really my only you know uh, you know I was not on the ground there. Um, but it was, uh, I, I was, I got the feeling that I, I surely wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of what this aircraft carrier was bringing uh, to those folks. Uh, like I said, we were there uh, doing this 
you know, seven or eight sorties per day and, and could be 60 aircraft at a time. From the day I got out, within uh, 30 days, I was back in Iowa uh, going to school to learn how to be uh, an auto body repair person, uh, like what I wanted to be when I joined. And uh, so I, uh, I, I did that. I went to, it was a, a year long school. And uh, when I got out, I went to work for a, a car dealership uh, in the body shop. After I got out of college, I was working in, in Iowa for the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. And I was, I had gotten a business degree with the, the intent of being in business for myself so that I was self sufficient, wouldn't have to rely on, uh, on an employer you know, giving me a job. Along the way, I, uh, I bought a motorcycle, I bought a Harley, and uh, was enjoying that. And, and uh, one day I was looking in the paper and I saw a Harley Davidson dealership for sale in Iowa City, Iowa. And I, you know, the little light came on at that point. <laughs> and I said, I could see myself doing that. And while I didn't end up uh, going there to Iowa City, I ended up here in Savannah. As most veterans will tell you, when you, when you spend time in the military, I think you get a, a deeper appreciation for what America is. I think you'll find as a group, veterans uh, more deeply appreciate the United States and what it stands for and the flag that symbolizes that. So, <clears throat> so I'm no different. It, it, you know, I've got that same appreciation and, uh, and so I think it's important that we fly the flag. In addition to that, there's a lot of veterans in this area. A lot, of, a lot of our customers are veterans. A lot of our customers are active duty, obviously, with you know Fort Stewart here, and we have Coast Guard Station, and we have a submarine base not too far away, and, and so a lot of military here. And so I think that it kind of symbolizes who we are. A soldier's job doesn't start and end in the battlefield, but rather continues right in their own backyards. Specialist Jardine Matthews reports from Columbus, Georgia, where sledgehammer soldiers led a helping hand in the community. Sorry. What are you thankful for? Soldiers from Headquarters and Headquarters Troop, 3rd Armored Brigade Combat Team, 3rd Infantry Division, spend the afternoon volunteering at the Valley Rescue Mission in Columbus, Georgia. Never want to show up empty-handed, Soldiers drop off clothes and toiletries for donations before putting on their gloves and serving members of the community a hot meal. We're proud of our relationship and close working relationship with Fort Benning. Part of the reason is because the largest group of homeless people in the state of Georgia are veterans. Working alongside members of the rehabilitation program, as well as community volunteers, these soldiers can't help but provide service with a smile while being showered with thank yous and other words of appreciation. There's a special bond there between active duty military and their families and what we're doing here at Valley Rescue Mission, feeding the homeless and hungry, because we never know what tomorrow can bring. Volunteering isn't a job for these Hellraiser soldiers, but a privilege. Showing the community just how thankful you are for them makes them even more thankful for you. You know, we can fight overseas, but there's a big fight here and it's homelessness. And I like to help people a lot, and I think this was a brilliant way to help, you know, the community in Columbus. Specialist Shorty e. Matthews, Fort Benning, Georgia. The Valley Rescue Mission provides spiritual, educational, and charitable support throughout the Columbus, Georgia area. Last week, I talked to Bruce Muncher about the upcoming Wreaths for Warriors Walk event on December 13th. For those who missed the interview, we wanted to show it again because of the significance of this year's event. The 8th annual Wreaths for Warriors Walk ceremony will take place December 13th at noon on Cottrell Field. With us in the studio is Bruce Muncher, the co-founder of Wreaths for Warriors Walk, who is here to talk about the event. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you for having us this morning. So for those who haven't been to a wreath ceremony, can you talk about where the idea came from? We got our inspiration from the wreath laying in Arlington Cemetery. Uh, my co-founder, Tony Justy, saw the wreath laying, he came to me and he said, Bruce, what about doing this at Warriors Walk? And, uh, and that's how it started nine years ago. And this year is unique because the eastern redbud trees were replaced with the white crepe myrtle trees because of a beetle infestation. What is Fort Stewart going to do to incorporate those original trees during the ceremony? 
What has happened, I mean, because of the beetle infestation, they all had to be replaced, uh, all 468 trees. What's gonna happen with all the trees now being replaced, the night before, on the 12th of December, there is going to be a tree burning ceremony at Cottrell Field. A platform is being built and the trees will be stacked on them, but not all of them at that point because you would be able to see it all the way to Savannah. And then the ashes from the original trees will be strewn throughout the new trees at Warriors Walk. What will attendees be helping with on Warriors Walk? Our guests of honor are the family members, okay? incorporated to make the ceremony a success. I mean, we have the VVA, we have the Junior ROTC, we have the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, all working together to make it happen. And if you actually take a look at the semblance of that, that's our future and our past working together cohesively to make it happen. And it, it's come across quite well. The, the young people, they learn, from the VVA, and the VVA can, can give some of that uh, old-timer expertise uh, to those young ones, and so they work together. So I also understand you, you brought something to show us. Yes. One of the things that we did this year, because of the replacement of all of the redbud trees at Warriors Walk, we created a special memorial or memento box for the family members um, and this is an example of what the family members all received. Uh, letters went out and if they w requested one, we went, we actually went out three months ago and we cut branches off every one of the trees. We numbered them and then as the request came in from the family members, we would find their uh, tree branch and we would cut it into an eight inch piece, attach it to this and so the loved one actually got a piece of their loved one's tree. Yeah. I mean, we all hold on to different mementos. We all hold on to different things that make us feel special and still close to somebody. Uh, and then at the bottom is a actual plaque that has their loved one's name and everything. So they were each sent, it, sent one of these. We are actually also, we have some extra ones and we are, people in the community have said, I want one, I want one. Uh, and so we are, we have a few extras that we are selling. Uh, they are $20, all they have to do is reach out to us through Facebook or on our website. Um, and we, we will have some to sell, you know. We, we can't, we can't do that at the day of the ceremony because we're not allowed to sell anything at Cottrell Field, but they can contact us. And, and where can people get more information about your organization? You can go to our website, which is w4www.org, or you can go to our Facebook page, which is Wreaths for the number four Warriors Walk. Thank you, Bruce, for talking to us about this really special community event. Well, thank you for having me here and for letting me talk about this event. Here we are eight years into it, and uh, uh, 468 heroes, that's a lot to memorialize out there at Warriors Walk. The safety of the community is important to Team Stewart. From November 17th to the 23rd, there were five DUIs and third ID. We can do better, dogface soldiers. Don't let alcohol end your career. Have some Marn pride. Don't drink and drive. Coming up on the Marn Report, Hunter has a Thanksgiving feast. Welcome back to the Marn Report. Are you looking for some fun things to do with your family? Then let's check in with Molly Cook from FMWR, who is here to give us some information on an upcoming event. Hi, I'm Molly Cook, and this is your MWR Minute. The Christmas trees outside Club Stewart and Hunter Club will come to life during the upcoming annual Stewart and Hunter tree lighting ceremonies on December 4th at Stewart and December 5th at Hunter. Both events will begin at 5.30 p.m. Seasonal music will be presented by the Third ID Band and local school choruses. Cheerleaders and Santa Claus will also be on hand to aid in the evening's cheer and merriment. 
Don't forget your cameras because Santa will stick around for pictures after the ceremony. Free cookies and hot chocolate will also be served. Blue wine will be available for purchase. For more information, call 912-767-6212 or visit us online at www.stewartmwr.com or www.huntermwr.com. FMWR, we're your complete destination for families, fun, and fitness. Free donated Christmas trees will be given to Fort Stewart and Hunter Army Airfield active duty soldiers and families on a first come first serve basis. Trees will be handed out on Hunter on December 5th at 6.30 p.m. immediately following the Christmas tree lighting in the Hunter Club parking lot. Trees on Fort Stewart will be available at the Newman Fitness Center starting at 9 a.m. on December 6th. Military ID cards are required and AFES will be providing free tree stands while supplies last. For more information, call 912-315-5078 for Hunter and 912-767-6212 for Stewart. A new 30-foot flagpole was erected on Hunter Army Airfield November 20th in a ceremony that saluted the military and quality education. The pole outside the Starbase Savannah School was originally donated in 1959 by the Georgia Army National Guard's 165th Airlift Wing and located at the wing's original headquarters. Read the full story in this week's Frontline newspaper. This is something we're extremely proud of here at Hunter Army Airfield as well as Fort Stewart. Um, today there are 76 star bases across 40 states, District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico. So the mission is expanding and that's good to know. In keeping with tradition, leadership from Hunter Army Airfield served soldiers a Thanksgiving feast at the Hunter Army Airfield DFAC. Colonel John Klein, commander of the 3rd Combat Aviation Brigade, as well as a Hunter Garrison commander and command sergeant major, were among special guests that showed up to support and feed soldiers. It's a time for you to share, have a little fellowship, break some bread. It's a great opportunity for leaders to show their appreciation to soldiers. During the Thanksgiving celebration, another special guest made his appearance. NFL great Herschel Walker joined the Hunter leadership as he donned a chef's hat and helped serve food. Our young men and women are putting it on the line every day for us. And the least I can do is get on the line to serve someone. That's, that's so small compared to what they are doing for us. The NFL great visited Hunter Army Airfield to convey his personal story with his disassociative identity disorder. Join us next week as photojournalist Zach Renstrom sits down with him and brings us his story. As we find ourselves in the middle of the holiday season, what better time than to learn a little bit about party and table etiquette? Elvia Kelly has more. Hi, I'm Elvia Kelly. You might know me from On the Frontline for the Marnie Report. But today, I'm here with Martha Jackson. She is the catering manager at Club Stewart, and she's going to go over table setting etiquette and party planning. Thank you so much, Elvia. I'm excited to speak with you. Well, first we're going to discuss proper table setup. What I have here is as close to a formal table setup as you'll have in this area. We don't do it where it's very casual, laid back atmosphere in the south. Um, but what we have today is, I'd say, just like a nice um, evening, evening setup for a nice dinner. Okay, so if I go into a restaurant um, and I see that there is a table setup, I think fancy. How can you show someone don't be scared of the setup? Very simple. Um, basically, each one of these items here are just, they're utilitarian. They're just, they have a good use. Um, you've got your teaspoon, your soup spoon, your salad knife and fork, simple steak knife, and your dinner knife. And honestly, I mean, it, I know it looks complicated and you think, oh gosh, like this is just too much, I'm overwhelmed. But really, it's not each item has a, has a place. It's the best way to eat. Your, your eat the food that you are being served. You've got your, your bread knife. You don't want to mix your bread knife with your salad knife. You don't want the bread, um, the butter flavoring your salad. So we, you keep those items separate with other utensils. And I see that we have the coffee cup here and it's angled this way. So I'm assuming that I can just grab the cup. Yes, yes. Okay. When you're setting a place at, or setting up a, a table for your guests, there are certain certain directions each thing goes in. Your coffee cup, um, if you set your table correctly, will always have your handle at five o'clock. You always place your water glass atop your knife and your wine glass slightly below and to the right. And it's all about ease of service. You, like you said, you easily pick up your coffee cup. You reach up and grab your wine. It's all, it's all separate, kept separate, and then it's just easy. 
Okay, Martha, mm -hmm. so I'm gonna have a five course meal. When they bring out the plate, which fork should I use and what are the rest of the plates? Well, first of all, you've got your charger on the bottom just to add a little bit of, you know, flair, pizzazz to your table. They're going to bring out, if you're doing a five course dinner, most likely your salad. You've already enjoyed your hors d'oeuvres while you were mingling with your guests. So when they bring out your salad, you've, you've picked up your napkin. You're going to, they'll, they'll place your salad right here and your first fork, you always start on the outside and you work your way in. The same over here, you start on the outside and work your way in. So you've got your teaspoon to stir your tea with. Um, once you add your sugar or sweetener, um, if you need a knife with your salad, you go to the first knife on the end and you've got your, your salad knife. So that's your first course. You know, and once you're finished with each course, you will lay your fork and knife down at the five o'clock and eight o'clock positions and your server will know to pick up your plate and move on to the next course. So I noticed your napkin on the side. Where does it go? Well, good question. Um, I know some may think that um, it is a shrimp boil so when they <laughs> sit down no matter what they're doing, but napkin does not go in your shirt. Napkin does not go, you know, tossed on the table and casually picked up to dab. When you take your napkin off of your place setting, you want to just casually place it across your lap. When you, if you're in a formal environment, you want to ever so casually dab lightly. You have to think, you know, how you're representing yourself, your family, if you're with your family, your company, if you're with your company, and just remain elegant at all times, even your napkin sends off symbols and, and signs of you know how how of, of the image you want to present. So we've discussed the first course. So once they clear your salad and they move on to your next course, let's say it's a delicious soup. So they've brought the soup out. You've got your soup again on the far, you want to start on the right. We've used this to stir our tea with. We've got our teaspoon that I've moved. The very next spoon would be our soup spoon. So when they drop down the soup, you're going to just enjoy your soup with the spoon and again you'll just place it inside the bowl once it's done and they will pick it up and head on out. So Surely but slowly the forks and the spoons and the utensils yes. are leaving as, yes. as the dishes are gone. Mm -hmm. Yes, you don't keep them there. I mean, you can if you want to, but it's just a mess and there's no point. So remember, you always leave them in the same position. Um, now, if you are if you are dining by the international etiquette, if you're using those protocols, um, you will place your, instead of this time, I, so they place them like this, so that your, their servers know my meal is over, I can pick up the plate and bring out the next course. And that's good to know for those who are traveling internationally. Yes. Okay. Yes, it is. Um, and again, we, so we've discussed everything, but I'm going to say the, the dessert forks and the dessert spoon. When you're setting your tables for your guests, you want to make sure that you have your dessert fork and your dessert spoon facing the right direction. Again, these things may not mean anything to 60, 70% of the guests, but there's always that 30% that are going to come to your party and go, they're smart. They've got their stuff in order. So it's, it's the little things that matter. Um, you want to remember that your fork, you want to place the, the handle end pointing to the left and think of it as if um, your car backing into a driveway. You're just going to want to make sure that it, this is the direction that the handle's pointing. The same with the, the spoon. The spoon, the handle's always on the right side. I believe I heard once, dessert is right. Put it on the right side. <laughs> Um, just, and just, you, know, you want to make sure it's always in the exact place. Okay, Pretty. and during this five course meal, at one point, mm -hmm. does the bread come out so that you can use the bread knife? Um, the bread comes out, it just depends on the situation. You've got folks who will bring out the bread in the very beginning with your salad. Um, I know some of the restaurants that you go to will bring out you know, like a basket of bread or they bring it out, you know, before anything comes out. The appropriate way is when your salad comes out, you have your bread to, to eat with your salad. Um, usually there's a butter, either a butter rosette or a butter pad um, that's placed at, um, it's, I believe it's 6 o'clock right there. So you have your butter in your hand and you just pick it up and you, you butter go. your bread. Yeah. It's nice and elegant. The thing that I have to...
that, that I like to to impress on everyone is setting up when you're doing a setup of one table, two tables, ten tables. You want to make sure that it's always the same. Every place setting looks exactly the same. If you realize I I, I only have you know I've got 15 people coming. I only have seven salad forks. Well then figure something. Do something different. Don't use seven salad forks and seven you know spoons or whatever. I mean you want it to be the same because even if even if it's not important to everyone, like I said, it says a lot about you and it shows that you care about your guests. Okay. You care enough to make a difference and give them the right setup. After our five course meal and we're mm -hmm. finished, that normally is associated with a party. Yes. Now what tips and advice do you have to those out there who may want a party plan for something important? I would say you want to focus on your guest list. You need to look you, the most important factors are going to be your guest list. Why? Because you want to, before you can consider your menu, before you can consider your budget, you have to think about who's coming to your party. What kind of foods do they like to eat? Do they have allergies? Do they have certain trendy fascinations with foods that you want to focus on to either impress them or make them feel special? Once you have an idea of who's coming and what they can and cannot eat, you want to sit down and create a menu, a recipe item, a recipe of the different uh, menu items you're going to be offering and create a budget. You want to, just because you're having a party doesn't mean we want to break the bank. I mean there is life after that party, there want, you want to have more parties, so we have to do this reasonably, we have to be sensible, so we create a budget, we look at you know, what you're going to be serving to all of your guests, um, and, and you just make sure that yeah, you've put, it's a well thought out planned event. So at what point do we consider, say, the color of the napkins that we use, or the tablecloth, or the flowers? We want to think about the theme of your party. If you're hosting a birthday party for your 10-year-old, what are her favorite colors? What does she want to work into the theme? If her favorite colors are purple and black, but she wants a frozen party, you know, you want to think how how can you work all that in? Because you want your theme and your you know their favorite colors for the linen to match. So that's it's it's usually after I would say after you've considered your menu and all that because that's very important. After you've considered your menu and your budget and your guest list, then you want to start thinking about themes and colors and you know what kind of napkin to use, um, what kind of tablecloth, things of that nature. And when I when I host parties, when I plan parties with my guests, like I take multiple things into consideration. If we are at an off-venue site before we really establish what we're going to do for decorations. We need to look at, you know, the walls, the flooring, the ceiling, like what will go well with it? Do you want to walk into a room and go, ugh, because like it's, you know, the colors are just jarring because what you've chosen doesn't match the room. You want to make sure that everything you do is within keeping of the whole picture. You know, it, again, it's well, like, while you want to make sure there's a life after that party, you got to plan, you know, we don't want to go too overboard. At the same time, you want your guests to feel like they are the most important person to you in that two to five hour time frame that they're with you in your event. And that means taking all of these things into consideration. And that means that we have um, a strategy and we have to yes. schedule way in advance to plan for something yes. like this. Strategy, yes. And that's a good way to look at it. I mean, even event planning, it may not be, you know, fighting a war or any of that, but event planning is a very strategic thing because you want to make sure everyone's happy, everyone is safe, food allergies, you got to think about that, and um, again, that they, everybody is happy and wants to come around for the next party. <laughs> I'm Elga Kelly. I'm Martha Jackson. Ciao! To find out what's happening across Fort Stewart and Hunter Army Airfield, we turn to the Frontline newspaper. Let's check in with Managing Editor Elvia Kelly for this week's news. I'm Elvio Kelly and I'll be giving you the latest details from the front line. For the November 27th edition, check out the Marn Voices Speak Out on page 2A, the Behind the Lens page found on page 3A, which is a full photo spread with an accompanying story spotlighting the Marn Division, Esprit de Corps, and camaraderie. And last but not least, congratulations to our mothers and fathers who welcomed a new addition to their family. The birth announcements can be found on page 3B. The Marn Voices are those in the Marn community who were asked a question for the Marn Voices Speak Out. This week's question is, what is your favorite Thanksgiving dish? Check out what they had to say on page 2A. The photo page, also called Behind the Lens, is always found on page 3A in the front line. The photo page highlights Fort Stewart's Hunter Army Airfields or Kelly Hill's awesomeness. 
The birth announcements are contributed to the front line from Wynn Army Community Hospital. They can be found on page 3B every week. Join us on the Marn Report to catch the most current news and events found on the front line across Fort Stewart, Hunter Army Airfield, and Kelly Hill, and online at our Frontline website at stewartfrontline.com. Welcome back. In this week's Task Force Fitness, soldiers and retirees can register until December 10th for the final outdoor recreation managed hunt scheduled for December 20th in the Bravo Fort area of Fort Stewart. Sign up at the Stewart or Hunter Pass and permit offices. 50 participants will be selected in a drawing. A $10 fee per hunter is payable upon selection. For more information, call either office at 435-8061 at Fort Stewart or 315-5163 at Hunter. That's all for this week's Marn Report. You can watch the Marn Report in the morning at 5, 5.30 and 8 and 8.30, noon and in the evening at 5 and 5.30, 9 and 11. Or as always, check us out on the web at stuart.army.mil and on Vimeo at vimeo.com slash third ID. Have a great week. Rock, Rock of the, the Marn. Marn.